Our next speaker, Dr. Brad Hufford of Penn, Un Penn Museum. Um, welcome very much, very early in the morning there with you, but thank you for joining us and um, look forward to your talk on Woolly and the site formation at all. All right, just sharing my screen now. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, reiterate the praise for the conference organizers. It's been great so far, and I'm sure it will continue to be. I think Willie's a great person to commemorate, and that we're still studying him 100 years later is a tribute. But of course, we've got to analyze him and continue his research, and that's exactly what I've been trying to do. It is now 100 years since Leonard Woolley began excavations at Ur, and only two weeks since I returned from the latest excavation season there. Woolley left London on September 26, 1922. I left Philadelphia on September 27, 2022. He sailed on the SS Rheinfels with architect F.G. Newton and epigrapher Sidney Smith, then was joined at Port Said by his foreman, Hamoudi, and his cook, Haj Wahid, both of whom had worked with him before. I flew on Turkish Airlines from New York and was joined in Istanbul by Adelheid Otto and her team from Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Most had worked with me at Ur before under the permit held by Elizabeth Stone of SUNY Stony Brook from 2015. Woolley arrived in Basra on October 23rd, but the Rheinfels only discharged passengers and would not unload its cargo until more than a week later. Thus, Woolley was without his large luggage cases, including the bedding for his team, and in his report in, to the museums on November 2nd, he said rather laconically, quote, considerable discomfort has been caused, end quote. While Woolley went to Baghdad to meet with officials and the king, Newton and Smith arranged for workers and the building of a dig house. My team arrived in Basra on September 29th. Our house had been ably prepared under the direction of our project manager, Zaid al Rawi, and we suffered very little discomfort. There are some similarities in two seasons held a century apart, but there are also many differences, particularly in the way we approach the archaeology and in our understanding of the city so long after Woolley's seminal work. His 12 years in the field have informed Mesopotamian archaeology as a whole, and I hope I can do him justice in reinvestigating his work and in continuing it to reveal some of Orr's many ancient secrets. In this talk, I will compare some of what we found in the three Sunni seasons with what Woolley found in his 12. I will also add information from the first pen season that we have just completed. My goal will be to talk about the site as a whole and its growth through time. And that's a big ask because in many cases we don't have a lot of evidence, but I think it's great because Woolley was very interested in the entire site through its entire time and uh, he was trying to investigate that closely. One of my first aims in 2015 with the SUNY team was to re-examine some of what Woolley had revealed to confirm the extent of his recording. I had long worked with his notes and publications, digitizing his reports, field cards, and catalogs for Ur Online, but now I had the chance to be on site and actually see what he had done. I wanted not only to check his accuracy, but also the way the things he had revealed had altered in the intervening years. The primary goal of the Sunni seasons was to find Ur 3 housing. Woolley had reported it beneath the old Babylonian houses in area AH. Thus, we began with two trenches in that area. Mud brick that had once sat atop baked brick uh, across area AH had almost completely melted away, but a great deal of baked brick was used at Ur in the old Babylonian period, and courses of these were peering up above the decades of soil wash. More than a meter of soil had washed back into the buildings he had revealed. Sunni Square 1 was placed to reveal part of what Woolley called Number 1 Baker's Square. It rediscovered four rooms of the building, and after we removed the soil wash, we found the floors where Woolley had stopped. His notes and publications were accurately reflected in what we saw. The published baked brick course count was exact for all of the rooms, and even his somewhat more vague note card mentions of unpublished broken graves proved to be accurate. For example, his notes mention a corbel vaulted brick tomb beneath room 5 that he found with no door blocking. He suspected this meant it had been looted, and thus he didn't excavate it. We did excavate it, learning about the construction technique, but also confirming that Woolley was right. It had been looted in antiquity, and very little remained of its contents. So we're down here in area AH right now. Architecturally, Woolley had recorded well, but his large numbers of workers moving at a rather quick pace over very large areas 
meant some sacrifices in detailed recording of artifact positions. Most provenience was recorded to broad area, if at all. But one thing that large and deep exposures can provide is information on the bigger picture of site development. Woolley was keenly interested in understanding all periods in the growth of the city. In a museum report for December 1925, he attempted to justify this position, saying, quote, the deeper levels are not likely to produce much in the way of museum objects, but a thorough investigation of the prehistoric strata would be of the greatest scientific value. The deep levels did indeed provide a wealth of data, and if Woolley had not dug his deep pits, we would have no indication of the foundation of the site in the Ubay period, some 17 to 18 meters down from the surface near the center of the mound. So this shows some of them, um, Pit F and Pit X, of course, very deep, the Royal Cemetery itself as well. But of course, they have filled in somewhat since uh, he left. This is what Pit F looks like today. And there is quite a bit of soil that has come back into this very deep pit. So one of the most revealing to this end was Pit F, also known as the Flood Pit, well below the level currently visible and under th nearly three meters of silt. Woolley found evidence of Ubaid period housing, along with black organic soil that he interpreted as the remains of an ancient marsh. In a report to the museum dated January 31st, 1929, he stated, quote, the stratification made it fairly certain that the terraced mound had originally been an island rising from the marsh or river. A cutting driven down to two and a half meters below the modern plain level showed the tilted strata leveling out and alternating with water laid mud in which the pottery fragments all lay horizontally. This must give us the limits of the original island." End quote. He believed he had uncovered the southeastern edge of the original Turtleback Island as he found less silt and no Ubaid housing evidence in deep trial pits beneath the Royal Cemetery farther to the south and east. It appeared that the highest portion of the current mound was seated over the earliest portion of the city. And this seems pretty natural. We're looking at the highest point right here, and that is actually south of the ziggurat. If we add uh, a digital elevation model, modern one, we can see the high points in the reddish colors, including high points on Woolley's uh, back dirt piles, which are the most noticeable thing on the site these days, uh, pretty much. And then this lower area, which is the Royal Cemetery, very deep. And we might suggest that the original Ubaid mound was somewhere in here. Uh, of course, I don't have complete evidence of that, but we think that the edge of it, if all is right, is somewhere in there. From the initial Marsh Island, the site would have grown out as well as up, though the outward expansion seems to have been relatively slow. And we might suggest that it started to expand uh, in the Aruk period out to this zone. Again, very uh, conjectural. A major flooding event, possibly two, covered the turtleback with silt that eventually provided more open ground. Into the deep silts of Pit F were cut many Ubaid period burials, while the deep pits in the cemetery revealed only Uruk and Jimdit Nasser burials. Here's the section that Willie drew of Pit X, and this uh, to the north is higher. Jimdit Nasser graves that he found sloped down to the south. And again, his section of Pit F showing the deep flood layer. And there is possibly a division here. There might be two different events. Uh, we're not absolutely certain of that. It's certainly a, a, a very deep area of silt, however, and this is largely Ubaid, and then above it we have Uruk and possibly the original turtle back in the marshes. Uh, we've heard a lot recently how it may not have been completely marsh out there. Uh, Jafar Jotheri's talk tells us a lot about that. But in this time period at the earliest, it does appear that marsh was pretty heavy around there. So atop the silts of Pit F was an Uruk period pottery working area. It was in use for a long time, resulting in more than four meters of deposit, including kilns and ceramic wasters. In the highest portion of this deposit, the painted pottery of the Jemdet Nasser period occurred and architecture was associated with it. So in levels G and H of this architectural material above the pottery working is where he found polychrome shirts that he says, uh, you know, are related to the Jemdet Nasser period. And then there are more levels of that architecture above. In all, Woolley reported eight levels of architecture at the top of Pit F, most of which he dated to the early dynastic period. 
This is a long period during which there was also dumping into the area that became the Royal Cemetery. Woolley stated, quote, the strata making up the dump in which the graves occurred are violently tilted, showing that the rubbish was thrown down from a height now represented by the prehistoric terraces northwest of the cemetery, which were identified in the season 1925 to 26, end quote. So here is his section of those prehistoric terraces here to the north and west of pit F. Um, kind of hard to see my marker, I'm afraid, against this white background. But the prehistoric terraces are largely located by these floor levels that he's talking about. Here, this one, he's put first dynasty floor. In some of his versions of this map, it just says prehistoric floor. But this is the early ED3, really. And I've tried to assess what his other levels are. And it's clear that the earlier we go, the deeper the drop off into pit F. We also see a difference in use probably here and maybe even terrace walls that are sh shoring up this higher area and out here there's things like dumping and manufacturing etc many early dynastic cities were enclosed by a city wall but there is no current evidence for one in that period at all nevertheless it does appear that the area at the edge of the city at any particular time were substantially lower in elevation and that the lower areas outside were used for manufacturing and or rubbish dumping, though there was probably also scattered housing in these low-lying areas. So by identifying drops in elevation like this, we might be able to show something of the growth of the main or high city. This is quite conjectural since we don't have a great deal of evidence uh, or of exposure at depth, and locating changes in elevation would require many deep trenches. But we do have some indications of the changes in several places, and that's kind of what I'm going to attempt to trace here. So we've seen Woolley's general interpretation of the earliest mound, and if we use the evidence of the Uruk level shown in Woolley's cross-section, we might suggest a somewhat larger mound in that period, dropping off to the pottery work area in Pit F and the burial ground in Pit X. So really that's all the evidence I'm using is that uh, we have Pit F here, the deep pit, and Pit X here. They're burying uh, deeper over here. They perhaps are living here and doing other things just outside the city. Woolley also found Ubaid and Uruk material in his deep pits on the north side of the ziggurat, but much of this was packing for the building of the ziggurat terrace. Nevertheless, we might suggest that this area may have been part of the early site, at least in the Uruk. There may also be an early dynastic foundation to the ziggurat terrace itself. Now, this is his map from UE4, and it is uh, famously inaccurate. This isn't really the shape or location of the pits, um, and even pits K and L aren't quite there. They're close. And this is his section drawing of pits K and L, and they have, uh, well, very, very flat stratigraphy here. So either it is just naturally laid, or this is packing, or something else is going on here. By the early dynastic one, we surely have a larger main mound, which nonetheless ends at what would become the Royal Cemetery. Here, there was already a low-lying Uruk Jemdet Nasser burial ground that was then covered over by ED1 administrative trash dumped from a higher elevation. At least in the ED3B, burials were being driven into the trash area, which had built up substantially. The early dynastic people may also have been building in what is now the southern area of the mound. It is quite high in elevation, which implies a long period of occupation. Furthermore, Sunni excavations deep in square three revealed some ED potsherds. By this point, marshes may have been receding somewhat and there may have been a canal between the north and south portions of the mound. So there might be a canal here, and we really don't know, but this is a high area now, and that is where we found at least what we think are a few um, ED sherds. So it implies ED occupation in this area. In fact, there was a great deal of water around the city through most of its existence. And here I'm just showing where I'm kind of imagining some of these divisions in different time periods, and we've got one out here that we're going to talk about in just a minute. But oh, as Woolley saw it in 1930, quote, Ur was almost entirely surrounded by water. A broad stream, probably the Euphrates, ran past of it on the southwest. A wide canal divided the main part of the town from a big suburb on the northeast, and small channels seemed to have joined these main waterways a little above the city. And that's in quote there. This is a corona image showing the larger area around Ur, 
and many of the talks yesterday were uh, talking about how we need to look at this larger area, and I absolutely agree. We know that there is uh, some discoloration in soil, and this has been noted, um, well, Willie noted a lot of habitation out here, but it's most recently been talked about by Emily Hammer. And there certainly is occupation out here. It didn't grow the same way as the main mound, though, and this is my main question, is what, what is it? Is it just a single period? Is it just scattered over many periods and didn't grow up? Why did this area become uh, walled? And that did not, apparently. We know there's a lot of water here. The marshes were certainly somewhere nearby. Even as they recede, though, we've got, uh, uh, apparently, the Euphrates coming in somewhere on the west, and we have a big uh, canal coming through here. What Willie was talking about is his suburb is Dick Digga, which is up here. We uh, also uh, find interesting on this one, we still see uh, Ur Junction. This is where the train used to come in to Ur. Areas around Ur were inhabited even in the Ubaid. Willie found sites like Rejba X, some 10 miles to the west, that had many Ubaid artifacts. And by the early dynastic, perhaps Ur itself had expanded to be more like Lagash. We have no direct evidence of this, but we can see the soil discoloration as we've seen here on the Corona satellite. We don't know in what period that activity occurred, however, and that's one of the reasons we're now doing more work outside the main mound. Akkadian burials are found in the Royal Cemetery and old Akkadian tablets were found in Sunni Square 2 beneath Willie's AH niche lane. So the Akkadian city stretched well to the south, but drop in elevation and or usage of different areas is not clear for the period. I'm showing a possible extent here of maybe even the or three because we have a drop off. Square two would be somewhere in here. This is square four where we've definitely got a drop off in the or three period. The city wall at the current visible extent of the mound was constructed in the or three period and the city must have extended to it in that period. We find a severe drop in elevation, however, in square four. Here, or three levels sit between 5.5 and 7 meters above mean sea level, whereas the mud brick walls believed to be or three beneath Willie's Is and Larsa Old Babylonian houses of area AH sit around four meters higher. It seems that the main habitation of the or three period existed in area AH and north, leaving a low-lying area of scattered buildings to the south. Or was destroyed at the end of the or three period, but it was quickly re-inhabited. In fact, the Isin Larsa to Old Babylonian period that followed saw the densest population in Ur's history. Willie stated that it was, quote, certain that under the Larsa kings, the whole of Ur could be classed as a congested urban area, end quote. Indeed, areas EM and AH are warrens of dense housing served by narrow winding alleyways. But once again, we have found a drop off in elevation south of area AH. Isin Larsa floor levels in AH sit between 10.5 and 11 meters above sea level, while those in square four, only 20 meters away, are around two meters lower. Now this is a shot of the deep trench square four, and it's in Willie's area in H. And behind you can see the so-called House of Abraham, the reconstructed house, but its floor levels are approximately correct for the old Babylonian. And we can see the old Babylonian floor level approximately in square four and a kind of visualization back here. There's certainly a drop off and I find that interesting. Um, over a space of only 20 meters horizontally, a drop of two meters is pretty severe. There will always be elevation differences within a city with minor variances, even within a single neighborhood. But a two meter drop over this distance is relatively substantial. Furthermore, evidence from square four shows that the low lying area south of AH, Willie's area NH, was mainly used for trash dumping in the Old Babylonian and later periods until it was finally built over in the Neo-Babylonian. This is quite contrary to what Woolley believed. He stated, quote, the NH site lying as it does in the middle of the walled inner city, i.e. in what might be called the best residential area, is not likely to have been unoccupied at any time, end quote. But it does appear that it was at least sparsely occupied in uh, many periods. In a period of dense habitation, the city may have grown too big for its walls, and this might have resulted in the rise of small suburbs. But the area in the south of the city was not overly crowded, at least not according to the evidence we can muster. Magnetometry, a technique Woolley could only have dreamed of, shows some relatively open areas in the south, and the space between old Babylonian houses found in square five 
confirms a much more spread out arrangement than in the neighborhoods nearer the center. So here's some magnetometry data conducted by Jörg Fassbender in 2019. And we can see that there are certainly houses. They show up, and these are the baked brick houses of the old Babylonian period. The Neo-Babylonian, they built with mud brick, and they usually don't show up in magnetometry. But we do have areas that seem more open. And of course, this is our square five where LMU were digging. And there is a lot of space between the two nearest old Babylonian houses in that area. So we've definitely got spread out uh, arrangements in this area of the site. We are also finding that the buildings on the east mound outside the city are not those of poorer people pushed out beyond the walls. They are well built and contain high end artifacts, including tablets, tools and jewelry. And so we're looking from a drone shot, uh, looking at the edge of the mound out east towards this low rise east mound, probably a canal in between them and Dictiga in the distance. So around 1738 BCE, Ur was again destroyed, possibly by the forces of Samsu Aluna, but as we heard from Dominique Charpin yesterday, maybe he isn't to blame. Whatever the case, there is a depopulation after about the 11th year of Samsu Aluna. Well, this time the city was not quickly resettled. Willie believed that it did not lay long without inhabitants, using as his evidence the fact that Kassite houses often sat directly atop the walls of the old Babylonian but they sit atop the baked brick. These are substantial portions of the houses that may preserve for more than 100 years. Their mud brick tops would erode away, but the high portions of baked brick would remain visible as we can see now 100 years after Woolley. Um, that's us digging on the uh, east mound. This is square six looking towards the ziggurat across the relict canal. And this is area AH as it looks today. And you can see there are still baked brick walls sticking up above the soil wash that has come in and these might have still looked something like that 200 years or more after a large depopulation and the Kassites might have built on top of that. So there probably were people at Ur after Samsu Luna's 11th year but in severely reduced numbers. It was not heavily repopulated until around the time of Kurigalzu some 300 years later. Yet we don't have much evidence for the extent of the Kassite city Woolley believed that there was no longer a city wall and that the backs of Kassite houses formed the only defensive structure apart from the presumed Kassite fort. Late buildings at Ur, the Kassite and Neo-Babylonian Persian are badly eroded, but they do exist even on the low mounds outside the city. And we can see some of the indications of Neo-Babylonian walls there. So even in this period, yep, the people were living outside. Without a city wall, the river and its canals may have been the only reason the main city mound was divided from the lower lying ones outside. We have only just begun digging on the low east mound, but we hope to find out when this mound formed. Emily Hammer conducted survey of the area in 2019 and found sherds of most periods, including the Ubaid. She suggests that perhaps both the low east mound and the high main mound developed at the same time. For now, we can only say that the East Mound did not form due to overcrowding in the Old Babylonian, and that it was not inhabited by poor people drawn to the wonders of the great city. Instead, they appear to be craftspeople working outside the city, perhaps doing lighter detail work on materials brought in and processed at Dictiga that Woolley partially investigated to the Northeast. Woolley showed us great things and we learned much from him. He also left many questions that we continue to investigate with modern techniques as we enter the next century of excavation after him. I hope we continue to do him justice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that um, terrific talk. Um, just open up the floor now for any questions. So please do um, type those in if you have any questions in response to that talk. Um, May I quickly, um, in case any arrive, uh, ask a question around the dispersed settlement on that East Mound and whether you think that's largely because they're freed from it being constrained by a city wall? I, I think that's possible. It's something that I'm very curious about because if they need the protection of the city wall, then why work out there? And it, 
we do have good evidence of old Babylonian and there is dense habitation. So they must be doing something there. But if they're worried and if they have a city wall, are they just living out or crafting out there and then living in the city at night? That doesn't make sense to me because you would have to leave all of your materials there and it would still be in danger. So I, the real answer is I don't know. We've only just started. We're finding good evidence of crafting, though, and we're finding good evidence of well-built structures. You know, I had expected maybe these are just squatters, settlers that uh, can't live inside because it, but clearly that's not the case. And it's going to take more excavation. And I hope to get deeper to find out what other periods are they doing the same things out there if we know that there's a solid wall in the Earth 3 period and there's dangers. Are they still doing the same stuff outside? Again, I'm not sure yet, but it is uh, very interesting and something that I think we're showing is a little counter to what Willie said. He did look outside the city, but he only spent, like Richard said, it was about two days at Dick Digga. He spent one day looking at a house to the southwest. And in all cases, he said, the area is too eroded. We can't get good house plans. We can't really understand anything out there. So let's not spend much time. We're showing, though, that there is a lot of evidence out there, and we certainly can find out. And I want to continue to dig in that area. Great. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, no, no, no one's um, rushing to ask a question immediately. So um, uh, looking forward to all this future work, which is opening up again, all these areas that, that um, Woolley laid the foundations, but clearly uh, much yet to come. So thank you very much indeed for, for mm -hmm. um, that great talk.